you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to grab them and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, fired up about this new series that begins today. Summer hits, told you about the music. You're gonna hear some great ones from the previous decades. Students, get ready. I'm gonna teach you how to build a playlist right here, all right? It's gonna be great uh, these next six weeks. Also, from a preaching standpoint, uh, we're gonna have our preaching team and a group of pastors come through here for the next six weeks. So you're gonna hear from a different pastor, uh, campus pastor Avery Lamel will be here to preach from Jersey Village, campus pastor Stephen Morris from North Klein. Some other pastors on our team and guests will be through here the next six weeks. This allows me to go to the other campuses and preach. And here's what I've asked the preaching team to do. I want them to bring uh, their number one summer hit, if you will, their number one life verse, their favorite verse in all of the Bible. Uh, that means something to them, that they've uh, just held on to, that they've looked to and reflected upon. And I think it's going to be an incredible summer. At the end of these six weeks, uh, you're going to have this group of verses that you can look at, that you can hide in, all, in your heart, just some of our favorites from our team here. And again, it's going to be a great playlist. Now, I love playlists. I've got a number of them on my phone. Uh, I've got a uh, hymns playlist. I grew up on Southern Gospel, Gaither Music, all right? My parents, that's where they took me for fun. And so uh, I would go here and, I, man, those hymns, those early hymns, and those, it got in my heart. And I've got a playlist. And so whenever I'm in a reflection mode or just kind of a melancholy mode, for some reason those hymns do it for me. I'll, I'll play it. I love it. Uh, I've got an Easter playlist. Uh, I mean, coming up about six weeks uh, from Easter, I'll start my Easter playlist, and I just collect songs all through the year, and I just put them in there, and they're songs that have nothing. They're, it's only about the cross and the resurrection, and it just prepares my heart. I mean, Easter, that's not even like the World Series, the NBA Championship, the Super Bowl, all in one, and so I got to get fired up. That's my playlist for that. Uh, I've got a Christmas playlist. Uh, now, that starts for me. Don't, don't you judge me here. That starts for me about... Uh, the second week of November, all right? And so for all you Scrooges out there, you can get over it if you don't start until after Thanksgiving. But, I mean, I wear my Christmas music out. I got playlists for everything. I've got a workout playlist. I hadn't played that one in quite a while, uh, but I have it. Uh, I've got an Israel playlist when we get ready to go to the Holy Land, which, by the way, uh, we are almost at capacity. We're taking nearly 200 the day after uh, Christmas this year. And so if you were thinking about going on, you need to call this week because Sign-ups are almost over. Uh, playlist for everything. Got a George Strait playlist because you can't have enough too much king of country. And, uh, I mean, I, I got playlists for everything. And, and what I want to do this uh, summer is, you know, playlists, you, they're usually a collection of your number ones. And uh, they have staying power, if you will. And uh, this verse for me, if I had a number one hit on my favorite playlist, the Bible, uh, it would be 2 Timothy chapter 4, specifically verse 7 here. If you need a name for this hit, we'll make it the title of the message today. I'd call it Last Words. I want to give you some context uh, so we can understand what's taking place as we dive into this passage of Scripture. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is nearing the end of his life. And if you remember from our forward series, uh, the study in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, Paul was uh, the, the main instrument God used. Uh, to take the gospel to the Gentile people all over the known world at the time. Now, he started out as an opponent of Christianity. In fact, he looked at the band of Jesus followers. He thought they were blasphemers, that he was leading people away, uh, that they were leading people away from God. And so he made it his ambition to imprison them, uh, to get rid of them. In fact, uh, when he met the Lord Jesus Christ, or I should say when Jesus met him, he was on his way, he had arrest warrants in his hand, and he was taking Christians into custody. And Jesus meets him on the Damascus Road, reveals himself as Lord to Paul, and it changed the entire trajectory of his life. From that point on, he worked tirelessly uh, for the advance of the church, for the advance of the gospel. And uh, what we see is him discipling people, making converts, he's building churches, he's raising funds so that these churches can meet needs in their faith community and beyond. And uh, there was no one like Paul uh, in that time, no one like Paul ever since. He gave the Lord everything, and he suffered greatly because of it. In fact, uh, this is the context of 2 Timothy. It's a prison. Uh, Paul is writing uh, from prison, and it's very unlike his first imprisonment. He, his first imprisonment, he was living in kind of rented quarters, and he could have guests come and go. This is not like that at all. This is a real prison, all right? I'm talking dark, damp, isolated. You ever seen the show Locked Up Abroad? All right? Think Locked Up Abroad. By the way, that's my nightmare is to get locked up abroad. I'm not very tough mentally. I wouldn't make it very long. I watched that show. 
and usually have to take a walk after. All right, that's the kind of prison uh, that Paul's in. It's dark, it's damp, it's isolated, he's alone, and he's awaiting what's about to happen to him, and he knows, he knows it's not good. Now, I want you to keep in mind, he's been following Jesus for 30 years, and he's got nothing but time to reflect upon his life, to reflect upon his ministry. And so he gets his pen and he gets his paper and he begins to write to Timothy, who he refers to as his son in the faith. This is a young man that he led to Christ, young man that he discipled, that he gave leadership to. These are two that traveled together, worked together, partnered together. You better believe when Timothy got this letter, he leaned in because he knew this is the last time he's ever going to hear from his brother in the faith, his mentor. And so I want us to lean in to these last words from the Apostle Paul. 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 6, the Bible says this, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. If you've ever been around anyone who is near death and they're speaking their last words, there's a weight that comes along with last words. You don't forget last words. You hold on to last words. Tomorrow, of course, is the 4th of July, and I'm so grateful uh, for our country and to be a citizen of this country. I'm unapologetically uh, patriotic. Uh, Both my granddad's fought in World War II. Uh, My dad uh, fought in Vietnam. Uh, In 2016, he and I took a father-son trip back to Thailand to the base that he was stationed at during Vietnam. It's an incredible uh, memory. I love our country. My biggest regret in life is not serving in our armed forces. My dad used to tell me, boy, you need basic training because uh, I you know, took long showers. And he's like, you need basic training. Uh, learn to shine your shoes. And so I, I regret uh, not being in the armed forces. I love our nation, concerned about its direction at times, uh, but nonetheless still believe it's the greatest country on the planet. And as American citizens, we ought to be biased toward our country. That's a good thing. You know, we're, we're kingdoms of a larger, uh, we're citizens of a larger kingdom. We understand that. We're citizens of the kingdom of God. That's who our ultimate allegiance is to. Uh, but as citizens of this country, we do pledge allegiance to this country that we love. I've had, I love other countries. I've been there numerous times on mission trips and vacations. But let me tell you, there's nothing like being away for an extended period of time, landing in the United States of America and hearing that customs agent say, welcome home. Ain't nothing like it. And there's a reason for that. It's not just because this is our home, but it's special to us because of the blood that's been spilled to secure it, because of the uniqueness of how it was founded, what it was founded upon. And tomorrow we celebrate 240 years of independence. But speaking of, you can celebrate that. Speaking of last words and celebrating our independence, Did you know that our second and third presidents, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, um, members of the revolution, of course, they were friends early on in life, Uh, both signed the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson was charged to write it, but uh, Jefferson was Adams' vice president. And as they grew up in life and in politics, their politics began to separate them. They had differing views on which way the government should run. Uh, They had differing views on policies that needed to be implemented. And it caused so much strife that eventually it separated them. Their friendship was no more. It's amazing how politics can separate the best of friends. Sad. Shouldn't be. Tragic, really. Another sermon for another time. But uh, Adams and Jefferson, later on in life, eventually Uh, did renew their friendship. And do you know that on their deathbed, which incidentally is the exact same day, you know what day it was? July 4th, 1826, on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, Adams was 90 years old. And his last words ever recorded, last words carry weight, significance, his last words ever recorded, was Thomas Jefferson still survives. 
He couldn't believe that it, his old rival had outlasted him. Little did he know, though, that five hours earlier, Thomas Jefferson had actually breathed his last and he had died. And some of his last words before refusing any more medicine, saying no more, no doctor, no more, he raised his weakened body off the bed and simply asked, is it the fourth? He was waiting to die on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Last words. They have meaning. They carry significance. And this is why I chose 2 Timothy chapter 4, specifically verse 7 for my summer hit, because I want these to be my last words. Uh, when I die, let there be no question. Debbie knows this. Put it on my grave marker. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have kept the faith. Now, I mentioned this in a sermon a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, I first became aware of this verse as a second grader. In my house where I lived, we had these uh, pictures up that my aunt had made. She had cross-stitched a life verse and put our picture here. And here's me as a second grader. Such a leader, even then. But I would, walk, I would, I would look at this. I had an older brother, so his was on top. I had a, a younger sister. I was the middle child. We'll, support, we'll, we'll start a support group here for all you middle children. Uh, I'll lead it uh, here. And uh, I, know, I feel your pain. My sister's actually here uh, this morning. Her family came in for the fourth. And uh, I was telling my kids last night, man, your aunt, I would just do one thing and she would just yell, Jared, stop it, so that all the house could hear and I'd get in trouble by my dad. Anyway, middle child, I would look at this. I would look at this picture. And uh, I would look at this verse as a second grader. And I'm telling you, it just got in my heart, became my life verse, even as a little boy. A couple of weeks ago, I had a, a, a person in ministry that I looked up to, that I was inspired by. I put him on a pedestal, really, probably shouldn't have. And it became known of a sin that surfaced in his life that he had dis not disclosed, and it, it became made aware of, and it broke my heart. Couldn't believe it. Uh, just a moral failure. He's lost everything. And uh, the first thing I thought of uh, when I heard that news is it's not how you finish or start that matters. It's how you finish. And I want to finish well. I want to finish with integrity. I want to finish in such a way this, this race that when I speak my last words, they carry weight. They carry significance. They carry meaning. I want this for me. I want this for for you. So how do we do this? I believe this text shows us the way. And here's what I want to do. I want to pull out three truths from each of these verses, one for verse 6, one for verse 7, one for verse 8, on how we can finish well with integrity. And when we say our last words, there's some weight attached to them. If, if we're to do that, write these down. Number one, we, we must understand that our life is not our own. This is verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. Paul is using the language here, the Old Testament sacrifice. In the Levitical system, when a drink offering uh, was offered, it would be poured out around the base of the altar to conclude the sacrificial ceremony. And Paul is describing his life in this vivid image that it is being poured out as a sacrifice. And what's interesting here is the tense in the original language shows that God is the acting agent behind this. In other words, Paul's life is being poured out for us as a sacrifice, but it's God that's doing the pouring out. Paul knew that when he came to know Christ and entered into a personal relationship with Christ, that his life was no longer his own. He even says this to the church in Corinth. He writes 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, the second part in verse 20, you are not your own. For you were bought with a price. When you enter into a relationship with Christ, he redeems you. He buys you back. And your life is no longer your own. This language of sacrifice, Paul would use it in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is your spiritual act of worship. Church attendance is good. Coming to Bible studies is good. But you don't measure your worship by those things. How do you measure your act of worship? It's by giving your body, your life to Jesus, all of your life to Jesus. When Paul came to know Christ, Christ didn't get just some of Paul. He got all of Paul. Paul is saying, I'm 
My life is being poured out. I'm giving it as a sacrifice. Here he is in prison. And he says, God's the one doing this. Just a quick little side street here. What does that do for your theology? To know that it's God that permits pain in our lives. God allows heartache. God uses trouble and tribulation in our lives. Sometimes it's his will that we go through the fire and into prison and it may be his will that we don't make it out physically. I'm getting ready to do a video series for Right Now Media. It's kind of a Netflix, if you will, for biblical teaching, Christian teaching. I'm going to film it here at the end of July and the title of the video series is called Trite not true. And what I'm doing is taking apart Christian sayings that we say all the time, just kind of off cuff. We don't really think about what they mean and they sound good, but they're not true. I'm going to take this one, that it's never more safe than when you're in the will of God. Not true. <laughs> it might be a very dangerous thing when you're in the will of God. Think about John the Baptist. Jesus said no man was born greater than John the Baptist. He's in prison and beheaded. Um, you think about these things. It's a nod to the sovereignty of God here. If you were to read the small print, it's this command that we trust in the Lord. I so wish we could have heard Paul's tone when he was writing this letter. I don't think it was defeat. I don't think he was looking at his circumstances and broken by his circumstances. I don't think he was feeling sorry for himself. This isn't Paul at all. In fact, Paul was more than ready and more than willing to give his life for Christ. In Philippians chapter 1, he tells the Philippian church that to live is Christ, but to die is gain. He said, I'd rather die and depart and be with Christ. That is far better, but if I need to remain here because of fruitful labor for you, that's what I'll do. If you remember in our Acts study, He's getting ready to go to Jerusalem, and the leaders in the Jerusalem uh, church say, don't go, don't go. And Paul says in Acts 21, 13, what are you doing? You're weeping and breaking my heart, for I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. He viewed his life as a sacrifice to God. It was no longer his. And this mindset and this perspective was, God, my life's not my own. And if it's prison, so be it. And if it's suffering, I trust you. It's amazing. You don't hear any grumbling from Paul when you read this letter. You don't hear any complaining. You read 2 Timothy 4, you don't even see Paul hinting uh, to, to get out of prison. Like that would have been the first thing that I would have said. Like if I would have started 2 Timothy chapter 4, here's how I would have started it. 2 Timothy chapter 1. I would have said, Jared, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, please get me out of this prison. <laughs> Do whatever it takes. That's how I would have started the letter. Paul didn't do that. He, he does, he's not even thinking of himself. He's thinking about Timothy, challenging him, encouraging him to finish strong, to finish faithful. He understood and when he followed Christ, he gave up the rights to his life. His life was not his own. Secondly, he understood this truth, that our life is full of ups and downs. This past week, we had our opening orientation for our residents here at Champion Force. And again, another reason uh, that you should give and get in the game on giving is we set up this residency program in the name of Damon Shook, our pastor that was here for 28 years. And the goal was with our multi-site strategy and planning churches all over North America, we needed a minor league system, if you will, a feeder system where we could raise young pastors up to put them on our staff or to send them out to great gospel-centered churches all over the world. And you bless that vision and you can give to that uh, vision through the residency program. But we have 20 residents on our staff. We'll have 20 residents by August. And we had them in opening orientation. And I was talking to them and I was level setting them about what 
their residency is going to be like. And these are students that are in seminary, getting their theological education. They're in a great church, learning how to work in the local church. They all report to a supervising minister on staff, wherever their passion area is. It could be children's ministry, student ministry. Two of our, uh, one of our residents, one of our summer interns led us in worship this morning. They're all over our church. It's awesome. But what I told them was, I need to level set you on what to expect out of this residency program. Because if I don't, expectations could be up here, and reality could be down here, and that gap in the middle is what I call the frustration gap. It's true in life and work, it's true in marriage. Can I get a witness? Expectations up here, reality down here, frustration. And so the only way I know to remove that frustration is to make sure that you communicate what your expectations are. That way you can hold accountable to the reality. Well, Paul, he, his expectations uh, were right where they needed to be. So when bad times came, he didn't get frustrated. He didn't get disillusioned. Why? Because he expected hardship. I don't know where this teaching comes from that when you come to Christ, all of your heartaches, all of your pains, all of your troubles will just go away. That's, that's foreign to Scripture. Or at least at a minimum, some of us think that we come to Jesus, we may have problems, we may have difficulties, but at least we're going to be delivered from them or through them. Uh, and, and we will be delivered through them eventually, but you may not be delivered from them. Paul chooses his words accurately. He calls life a fight. He calls it a, a race. Describes it as one of war, of competition. Again, he's been following Jesus for 30 years. And listen, there's been some incredible things happen. He's made hundreds of converts. He's planted a lot of churches. But when you talk about the ups and downs of life, you look at Paul's life post-following Jesus, and there were a lot more downs than there were ups. In fact, just listen to his testimony, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is this daily pressure on me for my anxiety for all of the churches. Sign me up. I mean, listen to this. Here's one of the most choice servants of God to ever live. And notice, when he's speaking his last words, he's not in the comfort of his own living room, surrounded by family and friends. But instead, he's 12 feet underground in a cold dungeon in Rome. And it's only a matter of time before the emperor Nero will lead him out and he will be beheaded. I didn't think bad things were supposed to happen to good people. Certainly not supposed to happen to godly people. But Paul, he destroys this line of thought. He says the Christian life is a fight. That word fight, it means a contest, a struggle. Notice he says, I fought the fight. We get our English word agonized from this word fought right here. Life is a war. It's a race to be won. And when we see life this way, when the down times come, we won't get discouraged and disillusioned and throw our hands up in despair and say, what is happening to me? No, our expectations and reality will line up. Listen, the scripture never describes life as being easy. In fact, the psalmist says, Psalm chapter 90, verse 10, the years of our life are 70 or by reason of strength, 80, and yet their span is but toil and trouble. They're soon gone, and we fly away. Easy Christianity is cultural Christianity. Biblical Christianity is hard. We've got an enemy to fight, an adversary that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. We have this sin nature, this flesh that is constantly waging war against our soul. We have this world, this outside world and its system who is, who is always luring us away from God and his calling on our life. It is hard to follow Jesus. But, but notice the words of Paul. He says, I fought, notice what he says, it's a good fight. 
It's a worthy fight. Dad, the fight for your fidelity, for your integrity, for your family, that fight's worth it. Teenager, your, your fight for your purity, to hold on for your purity in the midst of a world that doesn't honor purity at all, to not sacrifice your future on the altar of the uh, immediate, that's a, that's a worthy fight. That's a good fight. Moms, it's a good fight for you to look after your children and look after your home and care for your home and pray God's blessing over your home. That's a worthy fight as a church to stand for unity, to cling to doctrinal purity. That's a worthy fight as a country to stand for righteousness and truth. That's a worthy fight. Now we do it in a way that's honorable and loving, understanding that our, our, our fight is not against other people. It's against the principalities of this present darkness. It's against the enemy. It's a worthy fight. I keep this quote on my desk at home. I read it often to remind me every day. I'm at war. I'm in a battle. It's by biblical counselor Ed Welch. Listen to what he says. How long do we fight? Because let's be honest. It gets, it, gets, it gets wearisome. It gets tiring. The constant temptation. The enemy constantly trying to trip us up. How long are we supposed to do this? Ed Will says, how long do we fight? We fight against the desires that wage war in our soul throughout our entire lives. This is the normal Christian life. It ends when we have been fully made perfect, either through death or Jesus' return. See, the hardships of today is to prepare us and supposed to make us long for another day. A greater day. A day that's coming. And this is what Paul mentions in this final verse, at least to this final point, if we're to finish with integrity. We need to understand and realize our life is not our own. Our life is full of ups and downs. It's a war. It's a race. But third and finally, our life is rewarded in eternity. Look at verse 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You want to stay motivated in the fight? You want to stay in the race even when you're winded and want to give up? Here's the motivation. The Bible says you will receive a crown of life. I wish I had time to go into this. Maybe it would be a sermon series in the future. There's five heavenly crowns that believers are promised in the scripture. But you only get it if you're in the race. A few months ago, my family and I, we, we went to Disney on a Disney cruise. And uh, I love Disney cruises because I just camp out at that buffet. That's all I do. And uh, I eat. And uh, we were on the Disney cruise. And truly, that's about the only exercise I got is going from my room to the buffet. And uh, about day three, we were, we were scheduled to land on Castaway Key, which is Disney's island right there in the Caribbean. And they, were, uh, they have a 5K on the island, and you can run, you know? And so I, I talked to, to my girls, and I was like, why don't, we, why don't we run it? We haven't done anything except eat. And so let's, let's get some exercise. And so uh, one of them agreed to run it with me. And so we got to the island, and uh, we, we ran it. And uh, eventually we finished. And um, when we finished, uh, they gave us uh, this right here for finishing. Huh? And so, I mean, I'm proud of it. Uh, I keep it in my closet as a constant reminder that I, I ran the race and finished it. And so when I got done with the race, uh, I was tired. I went to, you know, I went to our little place where we were hanging out as a family because I just wanted to lay down and, and do nothing at that point. And I mean, I was all proud of myself. I had this with me and I'm thinking, look at what I got for running this race. And then all of a sudden, uh, Debbie came over and she said, hey, look at what I've got. And she had one of these and she didn't run the race. And I was so frustrated. I, you take that back right now. There, there, no way. I worked hard for this. I earned this. She's got one hanging in the closet as well. Now look, I, I don't fully understand what the crown of life is going to be like. But it's clear. You only get it if you're in the race. Paul he said in Philippians 3, I don't consider myself, verse 13 and 14, having made it my own. But one thing I do, I forget what lies behind. And I strain toward what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 
Chapter 9, verse 24 and 25, he says, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Paul kept his eyes on the eternal reward. And so he wasn't looking at his circumstances. He wasn't focused on what was going on around him, what was happening to him. And I believe this is what enabled him to finish strong and finish faithful. He wasn't living for rewards on this earth. But instead he was living for the reward that he would receive in eternity. In fact, he says, I'm waiting for the righteous judge. He knew the earthly judge was about to sentence him to be beheaded. And he said, I'm waiting on the righteous judge. God, that's who I'm standing before. Reformer Martin Luther said, there's two days on my calendar. I have two days on my calendar. This day, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's live for Christ today and that day. That day we stand before the Lord. This is the motivation we need to finish strong and finish faithful. We keep our eyes on the eternal prize, not on what's happening in the here and the now, but the day that we see Jesus face to face. This are the, these are the last words of Paul. This is, this is my summer hit. And I hope you'll take it and put it on repeat over and over and over until you make it your own. Amen. Thank you for joining us online. We hope today's experience encouraged and challenged you. At Champion Forest, we are passionate about all kinds of people coming to know God to grow in their relationship with Him and others, and then to go out and make a difference in the world. We would love the opportunity to talk and pray with you. To connect with us, just go to championforce.org connect. And hey, of course, we can't wait to welcome you on campus, in person, on one of our locations. We'll see you soon.